chat with this meeting is being recorded all right well good evening everybody and welcome to this june 7th pta meeting it's our final pta meeting for the 2021-22 school year so it's uh got a lot of exciting stuff to go over tonight so we got the couple of updates here from me got the approval of the minutes uh treasurer's report we've got uh committee reports if any uh, updates from Chad. I uh, got some two presentations tonight, which will be fun and entertaining. Uh, one from the George Mason University's Early Childhood Education Program and one from the school resource officer from Holmes Middle School, just talking about school safety in general. And we've got officer elections and then some closing remarks and the adjournment for the end of the school year. All right. So that said, I'm going to go ahead and um, just really the only thing on my report is our school transition uh, success kit, which we had talked about previously. This is part of the uh, part of the National PTA School of Excellence program. So we went through and we were looking at a, a survey that we had done and it identified um, the parents identified that took it that there's a um, little bit of, I don't want to say issues, but um, there's a little unawareness of what is going on around school transitions. How does the school help with transitioning people? And we took that to mean a couple of different things. Particularly, we took it to mean when parents are transitioning into kindergarten, when people are advancing, uh, going into the advanced academic placement or AAP program, and they have two options in third grade, do they stay at North Springfield? or do they go to Canterbury Woods Elementary? Um, then when they go to sixth grade, if they're in AAP at North Springfield, they can move over to Canterbury Woods and stay in elementary school, or they can go to, um, they can go to uh, Holmes Middle School uh, for you know, sixth grade middle school there. So that's your options when you're transitioning to sixth grade. Then we also had a section here on military families and some of the unique challenges that they face when they're relocating and getting started. So our goal really with this toolkit is to help parents no matter where they are in their stage. And this might be a toolkit that they could um, use for multiple years as their kid transitions between kindergarten, third grade, and sixth grade. Um, so we wanted it to be very multifaceted, but I would be um, very much remiss if I did not thank our PTA board on working hard to put this together, but also especially, and I do need to clean that up a little bit, but also especially um, some of our volunteers that are here. So our important volunteers would be my wife, Christy, Mel Carlos, Katie Frederick, Bobby Grady, Michelle Maurer, Robin Monin, and then of course the roofer, it's Amy and Carl who helped out a lot with um, various different things. So there is just a couple little small formatting cleanups that I'm seeing now that need to get done. But other than that, the toolkit is done. So we've got a lot of information on here about uh, what it's like going into kindergarten. Uh, this actually debuted in a soft debut at our um, kindergarten orientation this year before getting into the final toolkit. We've got the um, AAP. I'm talking about what is AAP? How do you apply for it? And then the different um, options that you have here. Uh, next, we've got, after this long section, we've got going into sixth grade, as I mentioned. And let's see, following that, this is a little bit more on that section. Um, then you've got welcoming military families. Um, a little bit of formatting is off on here, like I said, so we'll, we'll fix that. Um, and then we've got the conclusion that wraps up over here. So it is, um, it is just about uh, finalized, just those small little formatting things. The next step after this is to get, um, get a survey together, uh, which would be a quick turnaround asking people to take essentially the same survey that they took that led to the identification for the need of this school transition success kit. And um, once the survey is done, we finalize our analysis of the survey and send out our final application for the School of Excellence program by June 15th. And that um, the national PTA will review all the applications and they will make their recommendations as to which schools are identified as a school of excellence, which um, leads to some additional resources and some, uh, I think, additional funding as well 
um, as part of uh, being a school of excellence. And so that uh, the decisions will be made sometime in, our, in August and will be officially be recognized for a two year period before having to rinse and repeat and do this process again. So that'll be your year, Lauren, where you get to do that uh, again. So we're very excited to have this um, school transition success kit finalized and we're looking forward to getting the survey out the door. So that said, um, that's the all I really have on my report. Are there any questions about this transition uh, success kit? No, no questions. All right, Lauren, since I've got the um, minutes up here, uh, at least I had, yeah, where are the minutes? Since I got the minutes up here, um, you want to kind of scroll through a little bit with me and just sort of highlight before we ask for a motion to approve the minutes? Yeah, so May ushered in our first movie night of in a couple of years, um, which was successful. We had a couple takeaways from um, a crowding perspective. Uh, spring fair, we were gearing up for it. It happened and it was awesome. Uh, um, nominating committee came up with a newer slate than was originally um, presented just because of a couple of complications with a husband and wife both being on the same banking account and, and that good stuff. So um, nothing too crazy. Do you want me to go into more detail, Ken, or are we gonna do that later? Um, no, I can, we can kind of talk a little bit about it later. I would just say the only other thing is that, um, you know, the, the people that were identified during the original time this slate was presented um, are still here on the revised roster, just in slightly different positions in some instances, with the only exception being Tiffany, who is a current board member, um, VP of fundraising is now would be now moving into the treasurer spot. No, um, no new crazy faces. Um, uh, Amy was working on the final fifth grade concessions numbers, which I believe she has tonight. Uh, we did teacher appreciation, which was a big hit. Uh, we did grant Mr. Kimball his uh, teacher grant to reimburse the teachers that helped when he was out of commission. Um, and yeah, I don't know what's on the bottom. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, audit committee, we established that once we are closed for the year, June 30th, all things and checks and stuff must be written. We can get together with those people who have volunteered and um, get that process going. So the only uh, clarification from membership that I want to share is this one here on the School of Excellence, the um, initial, when we had our last meeting, the surveys were due, or the applications were due by June 1st, but they extended the deadline to the 15th, which works in our benefit, which is why uh, I just said the 15th, but the minutes say June 1st. All right, so is there a motion to approve the minutes as presented? Motion to approve the minutes. All right, uh, I think that was Karen. Is there a second? That wasn't me, but I'll, was I'll second it. Oh, who was that? Was that Amy? It was Amy, yeah. Okay, Amy motions, Karen seconds. Um, is there any discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye or give a green check mark in your reactions button. Aye. Aye. All right, all those approve, please say nay or a red X. Any uh, abstentions? All right, the minutes are approved. Okay, so let's move on to the next item that's over here. It's a treasurer's report. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Amy. All right, so we will be leaving. Oh, let me, where's my document? Um, there we go. Okay, um, so we had, um, May was a, pretty busy month considering we had um, Spring Fair, which was very successful. Um, it was great. I think everybody who went had a really good time. Um, we did spend some money on concessions for um, Spring Fair, but we were able to take in more than we spent on concessions, so that went well. Um, we really don't have much else going on going forward. The only thing is we are going to be working with admin um, in terms of 
finishing out Mathathon and um, uh, finishing a fall grant. Um, and other than that, um, I know that Lauren did mention um, the concessions payout for um, for fifth grade, and fifth grade had a total of fourteen hundred. Uh, well, almost $1,500 for their concessions payout, and that included a, the $500 match from the PTA. Um, and that's going towards signs and their, um, like, yard signs that they're getting um, and other things for their fifth grade promotion celebration. Um, that's all I have. All right. Uh, Amy, can you um, go towards the bottom so we can see, like, the yeah, bottom sorry, line? Sorry. That's okay. We also this month had the teacher luncheon, a teacher for teacher appreciation week. Um, and that was really well received. I guess we met after that. All right. Um, can you get a, we'll be get a... leaving um, at the end of the year. We will be handing over about $5,500 to take forward for the um, new, new uh, board. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so just, kind of looking at some things um basically if you recall back in the in the fall which i'm sure everybody remembers um very very succinctly uh that we actually passed a deficit budget this year which uh, i'm i'm not thrilled to be able to do that but it was such a um sense of uncertainty in the fall as far as like what we were going to be able to fund and um kind of uh where things where things were what we could do you know can we have events in the school are we not allowed to and so you know we ended up passing a 20 it was a 2200 dollars roughly deficit budget um by the time that the year is over and all the uh obligations that we have outstanding are paid out we'll be roughly at about a thousand dollar um deficit still from from this year but that essentially cuts the deficit in half for what we initially had, which is still pretty good. And that does not include, that's if you take out Mathathon from the work. So when you include Mathathon, I mean, there's, that's a whole different story, but when you look at just looking at non-Mathathon expenses versus income, it's um, about half of the deficit of what we initially passed. So we're in a pretty good financial um, standing overall. And just to kind of uh, compare things, you know, we were a little bit higher at the beginning of the year than $5,500, but it's still a pretty good, um, pretty good amount to carry forward for, uh, for Jen and her administration as she takes over the realm, uh, the helm rather, I should say, um, coming up soon. So that said, is there a motion to approve the um, treasurer's report as presented? A motion. All right, that's Karen. Is there a second? I second. All right, that's Tiffany, um, seconded. Yeah. Is there any discussion, any questions for Amy? No. All right, well, hearing none, uh, all those in favor, please say aye or have your green check marks. Aye. 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 All right, all those opposed, please say nay or red X's on your reaction button. All right, any abstentions? Okay, the budget, uh, that's a budget, the um, treasurer's report is approved. All right, next thing we got on the agenda. Uh, sorry, let me just, um, sure. I will be coordinating with the financial review committee um, in the next month or so to get them all the documents that they need for that process. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to kind of put some people on the spot here. Who again is the financial review committee? Tiffany, um, Bobby, and um, Alex Thorne. Alex. Very good. All right. So just for membership's benefit there. Okay, uh, next we've got committee reports. Are there any committee reports to report on? I think we pretty much covered a lot of it in the budget uh, discussion, but any, uh, any reports from anyone? No, I'll do a save the date, Spring Fair 2023, May 12th. Very nice. So just a day earlier than this year's. All right. Anything you want to say about the Spring Fair, Lauren? It was awesome. I hope everyone had a great time. The kids had a great time. We had a debriefing meeting. We had a lot of takeaways, good and bad, things bad being relative, things that could be better. 
um, we went station by station and figured out some stuff. So it should be even better next year. Good. And Karen, anything to add since uh, you were one of the co-party yeah. planners on that? No, I mean, everything learned so was accurate. I think everybody had a great time. Hopefully any parents on the call that have any feedback, you know, feel free to send us an email. Let us know if you have any concerns or questions about it. It's good. Yeah, I know uh, all the pictures and everything. It looked fantastic. And I'm sorry to, to have to miss it. But, um, you know, I know it was fantastic. And we're looking forward to. Um, oh, actually, there is one thing for the for the budget. Now that I'm thinking about um, Amy, we did need to uh, put a motion forward to um, oh, right. uh, approve one thing. So but uh, yeah, I know that one of the, the, the teacher do, do we talk about the teacher grants? Should we talk about the teacher grant and what we're are looking to fund oh the sorry are we talking about the um well two things i mean we had the, the teacher grant that um there was requests to fund something for spring fair next year but then there's yes. also there is also um uh, one uh reimbursement that we need to approve since we were over by like four dollars oh the art framing uh was it art framing i think it was the reimbursement for for the um sorry uh i think it was reimbursement for the uh, spring fair Oops, I think it was reimbursement for Spring Fair. Um, I think one thing that Ken is talking about is the um, the uh, mascot. Yes. And, and to clarify, so this would be for the Spring Fair, but it would also be for Beaver Blast Off for the general good of the school. And the only reason we couldn't do it and use the ESSER grant money from the Spring Fair was it, you have to use PayPal to, to purchase it, to pay for it. And the school is not allowed to use PayPal to purchase items. So they, they tried every alternative um, to do it there wasn't one um they weren't w willing to work with us at all so and i think this would be a good kickoff for next year's uh, beaver blast off where not only are you going to see some of the new beavers the incoming students but you're gonna actually have a beaver there with uh with chopper so that'll be that'll be fun and exciting for the kids for sure um but amy we did i think need to approve um the uh, reimbursement request since we were four dollars over on the expenses Okay, and the consent, I'm sorry, the concessions? Yes. Must be what it is. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not seeing that in my... Uh, hang on, let me... Pull it up here. Hmm. All right, here's the, uh, it was your email from May 11th. I can pull it up here. Okay, so we essentially had um, net income for concessions. Let's see. We had the cost was eight hundred and four oh, so dollars. Yep. Yeah. This is not. This is about um, fifth grade concessions fifth grade. for the. Um, this for, for movie, night. movie night. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, for movie night. So, um, all right. So basically, our bylaws allow us to go up to three hundred dollars over the budgeted amount. So we had budgeted five hundred dollars in expenses. But um, the actual cost was eight hundred and four dollars and twenty four cents. So we were four dollars and twenty four cents over our three hundred dollar allowed overage. So we do have to ask you, membership uh, friends, to approve this so we can reimburse some of the folks um, since we went over by a, a very small amount. So, is there a motion to approve? the overage um, on reimbursing the uh, fifth grade concessions. Motion to approve the overage on concessions. Thank you, Kathy. Is there a second? I second. All right, thanks, Dan. All right, any discussion? 
All right, hearing none. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye or a green check mark. Aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay or red X. Any abstentions? All right, the motion carries, so we can officially re reimburse that. Thank you. All right, any other um, committee reports? All right, going once. Well, are we approving the grant request for the mascot? Uh, I think we already had that. Uh, oh yeah, well we are, I guess te technically, technically I guess we, we do have the money in the budget for that, but um, as a formality, we typically have, in fact, um, that's a good point, um, Lauren, we have in fact gone to membership to say that we want to, you know, these are the funds that we recommend for using teacher grants for. So um, there was a request to have teacher grant funds, which we do have money left over for to fund the, um, the uh, chopper costume. So is, uh, is that a motion, Lauren, to approve? Uh, to, okay, so there's a motion on the floor there to approve the to expenses approve for the, the chopper. Um, in, do we have an amount on that? It was around, I think, four hundred dollars, right? Okay, so I'd say an amount not to exceed four hundred dollars. Uh, not to exceed, let's no. say four hundred fifty dollars. Huh? I'd say five hundred. I'd say five hundred just to be safe. I think it was like four, four fifty, something like that. Okay, so motion to approve the expenditure of the chopper costume not to exceed five hundred dollars. That's your motion, Lauren. It's my motion too. <laughs> okay, and the Karen seconds <laughs> that. All right. Jen thirds yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's almost unanimous, I'm sure, but is there any discussion on that? Okay, uh, hearing no discussions, uh, please uh, say aye or green check mark. Aye. 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 All right, all those opposed, please say nay or red X. All right, any abstentions? All right, Chopper's going to be at uh, Beaver Blast Off, sounds like. Okay, Chad, you're up, my friend. <clears throat> okay, lucky me. Um, I'll keep it quick. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Din, thank you for spinning some tunes today. Uh, field day went great. We, I think it was probably the best field day just because it was overcast and the kids were not just dying of heat. It was actually the weather temperature wise was perfect. Kids all had a great time. I walked into a kindergarten class this afternoon and a student was flat on his back snoring. So I'm assuming the morning was good just on that indicator alone. Um, we have fifth grade uh, promotion ceremony on Thursday. And I know fourth grade is doing their, um, fourth and third are doing some celebrations tomorrow, end of the year stuff. So. There's a lot of fun stuff happened in the, the last couple of days, and uh, we're just really excited to sort of get back to normal. Uh, Jen, and Leslie, and I sat down and took um, this week, we grabbed about, I don't know, 45 minutes and said, here's what we've done in the past, here's what we did this week, this year, and really kind of skeletoned out a quick calendar for next year, and I'm super excited, actually. We're going to try a fall outdoor movie night. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. That'll be a first time. Um, so hopefully, I, I really do hope that goes well. Uh, but it's just great to get back to normal. Uh, all the normal things we've done in the past. Um, so I think as rough as this year started out, as ragged as the teachers are feeling right now, um, I think the year has come to a close uh, in a great place. And I think PTA, we're in a really good place um, with the work from our ESOL team on the family engagement grant that they got and doing that survey. What we started this year as a, a PTA and kind of, I think they're finally starting to mesh and come together. Um, so I'm really excited actually on some of our ideas for, you know, continuing the work we did around family engagement, equity, getting more parents involved, um, just uh, the, the fair, doing more things to bring families in that are cost-free if, if 
you know, anything, the extras, if people want to do extra, that's fine. We can charge for that and fundraise off that. But I think families were so appreciative of the fair being, a sec, except for food, which we couldn't pay for. Everything was free. And I heard so many people say, this is amazing. Thank you for doing this this way um, that we're we're going to do it again next year. And we're going to um, apply our wellness money to that. We felt like it's a really it was a great cause, a great it was a great community event. Um, so I know, you know, Lauren and uh, Karen and he had said we did do a debrief and is meant is even though we found a lot of ways to get to do things a little differently next year that'll you know make it a little better um the overwhelming feedback was that it was amazing and the committee did amazing um and the planning that went into it was very clear and um just i'm i leslie and i are super appreciative to everyone that you know, worked on that project. So we're just excited to bring the year to a close uh, in a positive, in a positive way, get rid of COVID and all that junk and, uh, and just look forward. We got a new kindergarten play date in the works and uh, new and improved Beaver Blast Off in August. So I'll just leave it at that and keep everybody uh, excited. And by the way, our kids did amazing on the test. And so hats off to our teachers and, and, and you as parents during COVID. Um, our scores were great. And comparatively, we had high, a lot higher pass rates. They, they, there was a combination of scores this year. Um, and we, our kids relied more on just passing the test than they did a growth model which was a combined way to look at data this year. And uh, a, a lot of our kids just nailed it. So um, we're super excited and really looking forward to turning that corner next year academically as well. So I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Well, thanks for the update. Any uh, questions for Chad? Uh, Chad, are you able to share who, uh, which of the teachers might be leaving? Uh, sure. I don't think it's a secret at this point. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Lara Adcock is retiring, so we're very, very happy for her. She's our only retiree um, this year. We have uh, Ellie Oxen Ryder is going back home to Pittsburgh and to be closer to her family. And Anna Marie... Johnson, Ghana Prow. I'll never call her Ghana Prow, but um, her husband and her are relocating for uh, his job. And so she's going to be leaving us. And I know I'm missing um, Taylor. Help me out. Who else am I missing? Amy, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking kindergarten. Anyone oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, Erica LaRue's take, she's having another baby and take a, a year off a leave of absence, which we're really excited because Katie, her IA this year, is uh, working on her master's degree and got a provisional license. So she's taking over that class. Um, so we're pretty excited that we've kept some continuity in, in kindergarten uh, as well. So, and our new folks that we do have coming in are we're really, we're really excited. Uh, we actually are one brand new teacher right out of college is a special ed teacher. Um, and she actually was subbing for us and she's going to be in second grade next year. And she was subbing in first grade, already getting to know um, the kiddos in first grade this past week. And then she's since gone back and she's taken some additional classes. But for the week, she spent the week with us in first grade getting to know the kids already and her team. And um, But everybody else that's coming to us has experience and we'll do introductions uh, at some point. I'll get a little, all, all the uh, 
what people are comfortable sharing about their own personal lives and with everybody. And we'll do a little slideshow or PowerPoint on all our new folks, but we'll roll them out to everybody. We're pretty excited. I think you're, you're missing a big person who's going to be moving on. I'm in denial. All right. <laughs> I'm not saying it now. Leslie is, um, I don't know. It might be the closest I've been to getting fired, actually arguing the cause, which I clearly lost. Um, but Leslie, the region is, uh, they're moving up, I think about 15 um, APs around uh, to give people a second uh, or third opportunity or at just learning the cultures of a different school uh, to better prepare them as they are, you know, become ready to become principals themselves. Um, Leslie is clearly ready to be a principal now. And um, so I argued that probably harder than I should have, but um, it's okay. We're going to survive. And uh, we have a, a gentleman, his name is uh, Kevin Sammy. He's coming from Longfellow uh, Middle School. Um, he started out in elementary, went to middle school, and is now coming back to elementary. So um, We'll introduce him. I we have a meeting with him next Wednesday at school, kind of a transition meeting with him, Leslie and I, and then we'll introduce him to the community as well. Perfect. All right. Any Maybe other questions? I wasn't going to admit it. <laughs> yeah, definitely going to be a big loss for sure. Uh, not that we don't love you, Chad. But, no, uh, uh, hey, I like Leslie better than myself also, so it's okay. Nice. Well, are there any other questions for Chad? All right. Well, while uh, you are going to miss um, Leslie Mikulski for sure, uh, we are excited to have a guest speaker whose name is also Leslie. So it's Dr. Leslie LaCroix from George Mason University's um, College of uh, School of uh, College of Education and Human Development and uh, specifically in the early childhood um, education side. So she and I used to be colleagues when I worked for CEHD. Uh, it's been several years now, but uh, we're excited to, to be able to welcome her to our PTA meeting. And I don't know if your co-presenter is here with you or not. She, I was speaking with her earlier and then she had a, a family commitment. So Dr. Um, Blakia Steen is my colleague and we brainstormed things together and I am here and she is caught off being with family this evening. So that's okay. That's our, our worlds, right? <laughs> gotcha. No worries. Well, um, Leslie, we're excited to, to welcome you here, Dr. LaCroix. And so, um, you know, we definitely would love to hear from you. Um, this was actually an idea by uh, Bobby Grady, uh, one of our incoming, uh, hopefully incoming PTA board members who suggested um, maybe what are some fun summer activities that students can do um, from an educational perspective. So beyond just like going out and exercising, but you know, maybe, you know, how much to read or what kind of things to get ready to for the incoming school year. So being that you are the expert here, you're the faculty member that teaches, you know, educators, educates educators, you know, we definitely are excited to be able to hear from you. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the my microphone off and turn my mouth off and turn the screen over to you. Oh, well, great. Thank you. Um, so I, I can share a presentation or I can just talk whatever is most comfortable for you all. What would you prefer? I think a conversation and dialogue would be great. Okay, I can do a conversation and dialogue, absolutely. Um, so how about I start and then some of the things that, oh, hi, okay, we switched. Um, some of the things that I mentioned, hopefully we can engage in a conversation back and forth. And if I have some resources, I'm happy to share them and then you all can have access to them at a later date. Um, does that work? Okay, first of all, are there any, since that was on the floor, are there any questions that you have that you want me to keep in mind as we move forward? No, that's a good format. That's a good format? Okay, great. Well, first, truly, I was listening in the background to everything that you all have been doing this year. Um, and I know truly the PTA lifts and supports and encourages and very often we're kind of the, the cheerleaders behind the scenes, right? So just listening to everything you all accomplished this year was amazing. 
Um, so congratulations to you all. It is a big lift for families to be engaged in this way. And I, I think you really do need to celebrate yourselves as a board um, and as members of the PTA. So thank you. Um, that's my first little thing. The second thing, congratulations to you and your children and all of the learners at school. You all made it through an amazing year and you have found new ways to navigate educational systems and practices and processes. And it is time to go, Woo! you made it. So you do need to celebrate all the hard work that you all have done as families, as educators, and as children who have gone through this school year. I think taking that time to go, okay, yep, we did great, it is, is important too. I think when I start to think about what I would hope for you all and your families and your learners this year is that first you imagine and you dream together. And I can talk a little bit about that. What I mean by that is I know that moving into summer spaces, you all have dreams for your kiddos. Like you have something you want them to accomplish. If you pause, you're like, I, I want them to do this, this, this. If it's from clean the room to master all their ABCs and writings to all of their multiplication facts, you have dreams that you want them to do this summer that have been maybe put on hold or you go, oh, we could nudge here and there. But I want you to acknowledge those hopes and dreams for your kiddos first, right? But your kiddo also has dreams and hopes for their summer experience too. So when we start to think about transitioning from school, which is such a routine for them, right? And I have to go and I have to do this and this and this and this, and it's a wonderful space to be to this new space of now my schedule is different and what is it gonna look like? And even if we have summer camps in there, or we have um, swim team in there, or we have, um, educational day camp spaces that we go to, our routine is just different than it was when we were in school. So taking time to first stop and kind of plan that imagine and dream together. What are your child's hopes for the summer? What do they want to do? And then what are the things that you think you also would try and nudge in a way? And then have that conversation, right? And it can be let the child lead. Right? Let them figure out what they want to learn next, what they're wondering, what their goals are for the summer. So having that conversation, start a list, put it in the, put it in the family room, put it in your, you know, up on the fridge. What are your, what are your lists? What do you want to do this summer? And then try and figure out a way to make those things happen. So imagine and dream together. And I would encourage you to play your way through the summer. And what I mean by that is play your way rather than pull up the workbooks um, that we sometimes see um, children engaging in, right? So yes, it's really, really important for us to build in automaticity with our math facts, yes. But can we do it in a way that is allowing children to play through it rather than to just do a, a, a rote kind of workbook experience. And then we're going to talk about some ways that they're going to actually use math within the con context of inquiry. So when I think about play your way, you can build it in every day and you do it through focusing on inquiry. So remember, we started with this idea of having children bring their questions. What are their hopes? What do they want to do in the summer? that's a way to get into those questions that they might be asking themselves. And the summertime opens up space for them to do those inquiry spaces. So a lot of times when we hear about um, inspiring educational spaces for kiddos, what we're really talking about is inspiring kiddos to follow their passions. So let them do the leading. If they're interested about octopi, octopus, let them go and explore this, right? Let them go and read the textbooks about it, go on the Zoom cams, find the Zoom cams of the octopus going and exploring and do all the research. They can be the inquiry. They can be the scientists and be the um, negotiator of that context to develop their own books, to develop their own blogs, to take their own pictures, to do their own drawings. They were interested in just learning about an octopus, right? Um, so let kids follow their passions, offer choices, and then think about ex creating experience sparks. And when I think about sparks, they can come in a variety of ways. 
They can come from your child's own interests. So they said they wanted to learn about octopus. Okay, we're gonna go learn about octopus. They could come from a place that you go to visit. And as you enter into that new place, really asking about what is it that you notice? What did you notice here? It can be from the grocery store to a park that you go to. What did you notice? What do you wanna know more about? That again, fosters that sense of inquiry and turns the learning over to the kiddos. Um, and then helping them figure out a plan to follow up and answer their questions. So you wondered X, let's go in and learn about this together. Um, inquiries grounded in problems. So everybody has problems at home. Um, perhaps the dog is having a hard time getting up onto the, to the bed, right? So maybe together you figure out how can we solve this problem? It's a problem, he can't get up on the bed. Well, let's build a ramp. Great, so all summer long, how are you gonna build this lamp? What are you gonna do? You try it, you go through it, we did it, and the doggy still didn't, he didn't get up on the bed because the dog wouldn't use the ramp. But we had a ramp, right? Like, so <laughs> there are things that you can go through and it doesn't always have to be a success, but it's the inquiry process the addressing of a problem, figuring out how you're gonna solve that problem, the steps to that problem, and then analyzing it. Did it actually work? What adjustments need to be made? Do we just need to start from scratch? Do we have a new question now? Um, so really building around this inquiry and letting your kiddo kind of say, I wonder this, why do you wonder that? So focusing on what did you notice and why and how, all of those open-ended questions that help kiddos move into new spaces. Um, I'm going to pause there. Does anybody have any questions? And then I'll go into summer like reading spaces. Oh, wait. Hi, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, type that correctly. Um, this is, I'm Caitlin. It's nice to meet you. Thank you for your help. Um, I, what I'm trying to ask is if you have a job and you're trying to work from home full time, but also you do want to engage with your kid and say that they come with you to the grocery store, but I'm like terrified about my kids coming down and being like, mama, mama, you know, wherever you are, they're going to find you. Right. So I just, um, I'm curious as to any exa examples or websites besides the typical, I put in the chat, like PBS kids and, um, Tinker garden and all that stuff and not, not having screen the screen time stuff all, on all day. Um, some summer camps, yes, but it, if it's more limited, what are any suggestions to keep them engaged, like self-engaged? How old are the kiddos? Four and six. Four and six. So they're little. <laughs> no. Right. So you're right. PBS kids, a lot of the um, situational things that I would bring up would really have to do with um, reading, looking at books, exploring books. I'm not sure that I would keep them on PBS kids, right? No. If they're working with another, another, um, like maybe a young junior sitter or something that happens to be there, then you can build their kind of experiences around on it. <laughs> Let's say what? I said, I'm working on it. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. That's helpful. I think I, um, yeah, I have like a small list of resources from the Fairfax County website. So, um, I might build on what you're saying. And I, I think too, is if they're, they have webcams, they're nature cams. So if you put, and I'll, I can send a link to some different nature cams so they can watch the Eagle and they can look at, but actually having them draw the pictures of it, even four-year-olds communicate through drawing. And that's oh, yeah. an important kind of writing, right? So that's their, that's, that's writing. And then they can begin to write about the Eagle that they're looking at or the octopus that they're looking at, right? So they can imagine, um, they're creating their own books while they're watching that website. So I can send you that. That's a good but idea. Anything that helps them, okay, here's this. And if on the weekend you can go to the library and this is what we're looking at, or this is the animal we're interested in, then you can have that time to observe what's happening. A lot of the zoos, this the one website that I'll share with you has uh, curated web um, live cams from across like the world. So there are lots of different um, oh, okay. animals and things to look at, but I would always pair that with books too. So if your children are interested in exploring um, lions, I would pair that with books that you just get from the library that week. So then they can look through the book with about the lions or the big cats 
and look at the big cats on the screen for yeah. reels. Right. Good idea. Good idea. And while you were um, talking earlier, I was like Googling a bunch of stuff. And I think um, you can just build on like one idea, right? So talking about like a book and a video and then move on to the next. And then I, I took your other, you had one, I don't remember what it was, but I wrote it down somewhere. <clears throat> but it was like, oh, wait, there's like 10 other things here that exist. But then what you say right now? Oh, good. Okay. And I, I think cooking is one of those things too. So giving them not hot cooks, right, but actually putting together and building their sandwiches for the day or having them learn how to do those. This is the menu and we're going to plan it. Or even while you're doing something else, planning and drawing pictures of what they want to shop for next. That's another way to kind of set up the routine. Okay, while I'm doing this, you all can plan what we're going to have for next week. What do you think our food menu should be. And then they can bring it to you afterwards and, and talk about it and then help you shop for it and then do all the monies that goes with it. So you can build in those flexible times, but. Um, and it's the routine. It's yes. the routine. That's, right. the, that's what you were saying that I really took to heart is the, it's the routine changes, but it becomes a new routine and that's okay. Right. right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anyone else have questions since we paused and then you all can tell me when to stop talking, but. I'm gonna give a couple of suggestions about summer reading and writing um, because I think those are the big things that we're, we're looking at too, along with our math and our science, but building in um, summer and reading opportunity, write, reading and writing opportunities, I would really keep in mind variety. And when I think about variety, what I really would want you to take back with you is this idea that we have different types of texts that kiddos read. So we read fiction texts, but we also read nonfiction texts. And when we start to read nonfiction texts, it's our ex explorations of nonfiction texts that really bolster um, what we call our academic vocabulary. So spending time to really provide opportunities, like I just said, with the, the webcam, and here are all the nonfiction books that go with that. So in those books, those are going to be different types of words than we're going to see within our, our fiction texts. And fiction texts are fabulous, so you need those too. <laughs> Don't get rid of those. But making sure that you kind of have an opportunity across the summer to explore and notice with the kiddos. So that whole idea about uh, what did you notice about this book we read? If you're reading a nonfiction text, does it have different insets? Were there labels? Can they make that themselves if they're drawing their own picture based on the webcam since we're going, that was brought up earlier. If we're reading a recipe, which is another type of nonfiction text, it's another type of material, uh, reading to form a task work. So what do you notice about how this recipe is written? What's similar between this recipe and this next recipe that we're looking at? We can look at the box of, you know, even the box of macaroni and cheese versus the box of brownies. What do we notice that's the same and different about these two things? And these are household things that we have, right? Um, can you go and count the number of eggs that we're gonna need? How many eggs do we have in our fridge? If you're still working on one-to-one -one correspondence. When you start to think about learning how to measure, going from, I'm reading this nonfiction type of text, these directions, I'm gonna translate them into action. So that wondering, how are we gonna solve this measurement problem when we only have a half a cup, but I need a quarter cup or only have a quarter cup and I have, we need a half a cup of it. So actually posing the question back to the kiddo, it goes back to that inquiry. I wonder how we're gonna solve this. So looking at and taking advantage of the different types of nonfiction texts we have available to us and helping children notice what's special about those texts is really helpful. So we have maps, we have recipes, we have just the informational texts and then directions. Um, if I'm following directions on how to build Legos, that's a different type of reading for information, right? Step by step by step. What do you notice about how these directions are set up? And even having little conversations like that um, help children notice and then make plans for how they might communicate their ideas in the future when it comes to sharing how to do things or writing about writing their own recipes um, or writing their own informational texts. And then when we think about fiction texts, opening that up and making sure there's a variety of fiction texts. So from poetry to comic books to chapter books, 
to picture books, to plays, all of these different types of experiences open up different ways of hearing the patterns in language and also open up for kiddos different types of vocabulary words that they wouldn't necessarily be exposed to everywhere. So just keep in mind that different types of fiction allow children to hear different language patterns. Um, and so that's, that's a great way to go too. When you're thinking about summer reading, I would think about the different kinds of people we can read with. So I can read with, side by side with my kiddo. I can do read alouds to the kiddo. So I'm just, okay, now we're not gonna take turns reading. You read this page, I'll read that page. I'm just gonna read this and you're gonna listen. So maybe it's a bigger chapter book that you're reading together. Um, or a children's book, depending on your age or both. And then providing time for them to read independently and take a look and explore the different types of books. Um, the library actually has book groups. So I'll send a link to the library. They could sign up. I think their big theme this year is Captain Underpants that they're going through and they're reading through together as a book group. Um, so there, there are also book groups that could help support and engage children. So a variety of different types, types of text, a variety of different people that we're reading with. If they have buddies, that would be another thing that you could do in an online, they could read back and forth. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be in the same place now that we have Zoom, we can read together um, if we all have the same book. And then think about different places you might read. It's fun to go ahead and take your book to the park and enjoy being in there and, and reading and exploring together. Not to mention just all of the informational text that's in a park. Any questions about different reading spaces? Yeah, actually, I had a really quick question. Um, <laughs> are there any studies that you know of on the method of how a kid is receiving or hearing the book um, and if that's effective in their learning? So, for example, um, you know, my child listens to audible books like for hours. Um, you know, is that a... Um, beneficial method of you know getting the vocabulary and, and that sort of thing or is it truly that it's better to be read to you by a person that's there you know any any feedback on that area or cds i mean there's you know all these different options now so audiobooks are amazing you enjoy audiobooks right we enjoy listening to the radio and npr stories or we listen to the the blog stories that come out audio um Books or stories are great ways to learn and hear um, language. So when we listen to an audio story um, or a story that's being read to us, we, we build fluency because we understand the rhythm of words. Right? We also begin to build our vocabulary because we hear a word frequently over and over and over again. When I have that word in my brain, it becomes easier than for me to read it when I see it in front of me, right? So listening to audiobooks and a lot of different audiobooks is a great way to continue to build um, vocabulary. And that vocabulary knowledge is also going to help me understand um, the text when I begin to decode them in the future because I'm going to be able to anticipate and understand what those words are. I'm also going to understand how those different words sound, right? So we can, yes, there is definite correlation between listening to audiobooks. It's a, it's a good strength. I wouldn't stop doing that. Reading with people is also equally engaging because there's nothing more powerful than going, and hey, guess what happened? And sharing those moments together or reading. And I like, even with my kiddos, I would read um, my third graders. We would read Charlotte's Web and we would all be reading it together and we would stop. And I get to the end every single year. It wouldn't matter. I'd cry. And we'd all cry because I was crying, right? So there is a different type of emotional connectivity that can happen when you are reading and that and engaging in this shared literacy experience. So it doesn't need to be the only, I wouldn't say that should be the only thing that the kiddo is doing in terms of acquiring literacy, having that human connection and being in story together, I think is a really important part of um, nurturing that love of literature. Does that make sense? I'll give you three really good spaces to go for books. These are my favorite spaces when I'm looking for new books to read. Um, the first one would be the Virginia Reader's Choice book lists. And I would go back, they have all of the lists um, that have happened for a number of years now. And I would go back and read those. The My favorite one, if you haven't heard of Virginia Reader's Choice yet, do you do that at your school? 
Virginia Reader's Choice is put on. It might be a program for you all. Oh, go ahead. Do you do it? Yeah, no, they, uh, they, we highlight those books in the library, yes. Perfect, perfect. Um, so it, it could be books that the kiddos are already familiar with, right? But it's a great way to kind of curate really quickly a set of 10 books that you might explore for primary. So K, K2, K3, and then um, upper elementary, three, four, six, right? A, a set of that gives you 20 books for the past 10 years, five years, I think it's on the website that you can go back to and look at. Um, rich experiences to explore. And then you can do your own Virginia Reader's Choice. Which book would have been your favorite? The goal of the Virginia Reader's Choice, they select 10 for each of those categories. The kids read a number of them and then they get to vote. So every year, um, a different book wins from each category, but you can do the same thing at, your, at, at home. I'll go back, we can read all these books together. Which one would you have voted for? Um, National Science Teaching Association Book Awards. Just Google it and that whole list, the, the winner this year is the Beak Book and it goes through all different kinds of beaks. Um, and then the other space that I would go would be the National Council of Social Studies um, offers a Carter J. Woods, G. Woodson Book Award and they recommend a number of um, different types of social studies texts you might engage in. And that award winner um, this year is William Still and his freedom stories. So it's stories about the Underground Railroad. Any questions about other spaces you might go for books? And of course your library. Okay. Yeah, and if you um, have like the resources you wanted to share with us, we can definitely get it out to membership and put it in the description of the YouTube video that we'll post um, of this re the recording of this meeting uh, following uh, the conclusion. But um, yeah, that's uh, it's fantastic. So any last questions for Dr. LaCroix? Yes, could you talk a little bit about writing? Yes. Okay, okay. so <laughs> writing is my favorite thing in the world. Um, it is not my children's. <laughs> so they love reading. The book part is not a problem. The and how old are your kiddos? They're finishing first and fourth. So. I will tell you that the quickest way that might be really inspiring for them is if you have access to a older family member, um, perhaps a, the, a cousin um, who might be uh, high school, college, start a pen pal program with them. And one reason I say this is I had my niece who um, is in second grade, was in second grade, and her teacher said, hey, this year, you got to find a pen pal. She chose my son, who was uh, a sophomore in college, and they have been writing this, this pen pal relationship has now gone on for three years. And the types of writing that is coming from my niece, who was a reluctant writer to begin with, is huge because she started with pictures and then she would do these little jokes. They wrote jokes back and forth. And then it started to move into making my son's name into a, a like a, um, what it was, the most recent one was a Gamanity. So she made him into, uh, his name is Gannon. So Gannon and Manatee and made him a Gamanity. So these creative spaces for her to write to an authentic audience is what's essential. So if you can provide ways um, that allow them to think about who they might write to, that could be one way to do it. The other um, suggestion that I would have if they're into any sort of natures or bugs or um, anything outside-y is to maybe take it from a perspective of a naturalist. And I have some resources here where they could become citizen scientists. So they actually do the data recording and that data recording um, is shared with an authentic audience as well, but that allows them to identify bugs, identify birds, and they can begin to write their descriptions. So writing in nonfiction is also really a relevant way to begin to develop their writing um, and their literacy skills, which is only gonna support their reading skills. So I would try and build it into what their interests are. If they have someone that they could write to or even a pen pal friend that they know in class, um, and make it short postcards, start with postcards first, um, or start with small um, little mini blogs you can use. I think schools can use Flipgrid. 
Um, and then there are other spaces that children could write in and then share back and forth too. Flipgrid uses a video, but there's they could write and then read it to them. Um, any Thank other you. thoughts about writing? That was great. Thank you. Okay. And there are lots more. I would recommend graphic organizers to do their own natural stories. Um, so who do you want characters to be? What do you think is going to happen? But support it. So there are lots of different ways, but those two, I think, are the most accessible. Finding a friend to write with and then writing your own science stuff. Sorry. Thank you. Well, th thank you so much for your insight, Leslie. It's always great to hear from uh, our Mason faculty. So it's a great, uh, great college of education and human development school of education. The yeah, when I was there, it was graduate school of education. Now it's just school of education as they expanded to bachelor's degrees. So great. So excited to have um, you here. So thank you so much. Feel free to join us for the rest of our, our meeting or drop and get some of your time back. Uh, but and you know, totally I would to like to just emphasize the whole idea of a pen pal. Our first graders started it with a, um, uh, I got I'm trying to figure out how to politically say a nursing home. <laughs> it's an elder care facility um, through a friend of mine up in Maryland, and she runs the activities programs and um, senior center, whoever said that, yes. Um, and um, so she's like, hey, can we get pen pals? And the kids, some of those kids are reluctant writers, had a purpose and holy cow, they wrote amazing letters. I think they did like four or five rounds of letters back and forth this year. So it really does make a difference if they can have that connection. Um, but that's huge and I love that recommendation. Good. I use it with my pre-service teachers. They find we have pen pals that we write to in schools and it makes a big difference for them too. So it's exciting. Everybody loves to get a letter. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much again, Leslie. We really appreciate it. And you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> thank you all. all right. thank Thanks you. for the experience. You guys have a great summer. Enjoy it. Ask those questions. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So our next speaker we have here is Officer Harvey. He is the SRO over at Holmes Middle School, school resource officer. And uh, given some recent events, you know, we thought it would be appropriate to talk a little bit about school safety. Now, please note this is not any kind of political statement, uh, but being that we are in the Annandale High School Pyramid and many of your students, when they go on to sixth grade, will be transitioning and transferring over to Holmes Middle School. Uh, we thought it was a, a great opportunity to build that bridge between North Springfield Elementary and Holmes even further. So, uh, Officer Harvey, just want to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to let you know before I start that the allergies are slowly trying to kill me. So if I go off camera and cough a little bit, I apologize. I'm trying to work through it. Um, but when, especially when I speak for an extended period of time, this is often uh, an issue. So if I cough, I apologize. Um, but I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Officer Harvey. Uh, I'm a police officer with the Fairfax County Police Department. And my current assignment is a school resource officer at Holmes Middle School. Um, prior to that, I had worked um, primarily in patrol on midnights as well as um, day work. Um, and I wanted to get in the SRO position, especially because I've been working midnights um, and I'd unfortunately run into a, a, a disproportionate amount of young men and women who were not doing things they were supposed to be doing at three o'clock in the morning. So my goal was, uh, as a school resource officer, to hopefully provide a positive impact at the school level to keep the kids off the street and in the house and doing the things that they need to do, as opposed to me having to deal with them at three o'clock in the morning, you know, because frankly, it's, it's, it's hard, it's rough to have to go through all that. And I, I want these kids to be successful, and that's why I'm a school resource officer. Um, I'll answer the first question that usually comes around. I am a real police officer. I'm not like, uh, I don't work in a mall. You know, I don't go around on a Segway or anything like that. I'm a certified police officer in the state of Virginia. Um, 
you know, I, the role itself um, is multifaceted. You know, I'm primarily, um, I am a police officer, so I do investigate criminal offenses that do, inter do occur in the school. When, when that does happen, uh, sometimes people get it misconstrued. We are not trying to punish anyone. We are not trying to set them down the path in which they um, are set up for failure. The end game is we are trying to put them on a path in order to and find alternative means, you know, specifically the alternative accountability program, restorative justice, those type of programs that we can provide for them instead of throwing them in the court system or the juvenile intake or, or what have you. The, the end game is we want these young men and women to be successful ultimately and don't want this extra baggage held over their head. Um, you know, as a mentor and, and liaison, as a mentor, uh, I, I want the students to see me as a human being, see that, you know, I'm not perfect. Uh, I've been in their shoes and I often ask that question when I'm in middle school is, was I that goofy when I was in middle school? And I would have to assume that the answer is probably yes, but I'm 42 years old now and, you know, it's been some time. And so, you know, I try and provide them, you know, I, you know, I, I conduct classes, I conduct, you know, training at the school level, you know, whether it be uh, alcohol, um, tobacco, narcotics prevention, um, legal training. Um, I'll do something as, as simple as sitting down with a student and helping him with his homework, if the case need be, which I've done a couple of times. And frankly, I had to knock the cobwebs off because uh, it's been some time since I've been in school. Um, you know, I, I am not a, a um, I don't work at the behest of the school district. I am a Fairfax County police officer. So I have a chain of command. I have um, supervisors and bosses that I answer to. I'm not a disciplinarian. Um, you know, I, what I end up doing is I, I consider myself to be a, an asset for the school and a tool that can be utilized. Um, but I'm usually, I like to consider myself very simply put as a, as a last resort because I want to work with those kids. I want to mediate, I want to help them. And then that's, that's normally when I would come in if all else has, has failed essentially. You know, as an SR, SRO, you know, we, we, we end up having a substantial amount of mental health training, disability awareness, and um, I'm a certified crisis intervention team member, which means that um, I, I understand the many facets of mental illness and, and essentially how to kind of work with that in order to get that individual the necessary treatment they need. Um, we take cultural proficiency and implicit bias awareness. Um, we're well-versed in restorative justice uh, techniques and alternative accountability programs, which are um, side avenues as opposed to the court systems. We deal with disaster and emergency response. Like we've had uh, tremendous amounts of tactical training, first aid. Um, and then we've also done uh, substantial active shooter training. You know, uh, we've got, you know, hopefully that will never, ever, ever in a million years, knock on wood, ever happen. But police officers and the staff at the school are prepared and we understand what our roles are. Um, you know, we understand state and federal law and you know the department the various department policies and everything else that we we have the biggest thing um you know it's going to be a weird transition because students are coming from elementary school where we're uh, SROs are not there um there's several reasons for that but primarily we don't we don't act as in the law enforcement role for 12 and under primarily but you know, we, we, a lot of their issues that we see often start to, to rise in middle school and high school. And so that's why we're kind of there to, as a deterrent. Um, you know, the one deterrent that I didn't mention was the simple visual deterrent. Uh, being at the school, walking the perimeter, you know, being in the hallways, interacting with teachers, staff, students, and everybody else, making myself well known that I'm there. That in itself will, if anyone has any uh, uh, 
ill intent, they will often think twice about it because I'm there, you know, and that's part of the goal. Um, trying to think what else here. You know, I mean, we, we do a whole bunch of different things. I know at the end of June, we're doing a road dog camp, which is a, uh, you know, kids that have had some disciplinary issues. What we often do is we, we, we enroll them and provide them an opportunity for them to uh, um, take some decision-making courses. Uh, we do some sports events, teamwork building exercises. We do tours of the police and fire facilities. You know, for, for ask, at risk youth that, you know, that are showing a lot of potential that just need a little bit of steering in the right direction. Um, I mean, I, I guess you can kind of say the Nesro is a, like a Swiss army knife. I mean, there's, you know, I can open a can of tuna and I can also cut open a box, whatever. I can do anything. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, I could probably go on for hours, uh, but I wanted to just kind of give you an idea of who I am, what my role is, and to give you the Cliff Notes version essentially of that. And then hopefully answer any questions that you may have um, regarding the program, uh, any concerns that you have regarding well, anything. And if I don't know the answer, uh, I'll certainly circle back and try and get it to you. Well, thank you so much, um, Officer Harvey. We do have one question in the chats here. I mean, how do the police department determine which schools send a designated SRO? Um, and like, how do you get uh, those specific assignments to like homes in your case? And what criteria yeah. does the police use? So the, the way in which they do it is they often, it's called a, a pro, we call it a process. Um, when when um, there's either a transfer, retirement, or, you know, the, or an opening of sorts, what they will do is create a process. Um, they have certain, you know, time and time and grade experiences. You have to be a police officer for X amount of years. And, and you kind of, um, what happens is you go before a panel of uh, school personnel uh, the SRO supervisor, your station commander, and then what they'll do is they'll, they'll, it is a very intense um, job interview, uh, and they'll often ask you like um, situational kind of questions, like you're in this position, how would you react to it? And they kind of uh, put you in the grinder a little bit to see how you you function. Um, the big thing is uh, empathy the ability to communicate. Um, and obviously, you know, like for me, I, I've had a, I had military experience. I also had a lot of experience prior to this with, with public speaking and working with um, in a corporate environment, <laughs> dealing with individuals that, you know, uh, required a lot of time and effort, so. Um, we have another question here in the chats. Um, I know that there is a, another jurisdiction in the area that actually removed funding for SROs, um, but then voted to restore it. Uh, is there any kind of risk of losing SROs here in Fairfax County? No, you know, <clears throat> what I've been told is that Chief Davis is very supportive of the program and he has no intention whatsoever of getting rid of the program. Uh, he told us that he has held up his end of the bargain thus far, so I have no reason to doubt it otherwise. I, I think that, um, you know, they, they, they wanted to try something in, in, you know, I'm not here to decide whether it worked or didn't work or whatever, but they, they decide, you know, that respective jurisdiction decided to turn it around and re reintroduce it. Um, but from my understanding, Fairfax is not gonna be getting rid of the SRO program. Okay. Now, um, since there are no SROs in, at the elementary level, what kind of safety standards and safety measures are in place that you can share without giving away too many of the trade secrets for, you know, obvious reasons? Well, I, I know that um, they have extremely high quality camera systems that document just about every square inch of every school. I know that we have a, uh, a, a robust alarm system that is tracked uh, at the Office of School Security. Uh, in addition to law enforcement and SROs, we have the Office of School Security where they actually have patrolling units that will focus on the schools and, and keep an eye on them 
if we're indisposed or just we're out about and everything else. Um, yeah, I, I want to keep that kind of close to my my hip pocket, but I can assure you that there's a lot of technology, a lot of manpower, and a lot of assets, especially in Fairfax County, that are at our disposal to keep the school, school safe. Yeah, I would second that too. I mean, the camera system is our go-to um, yeah. for a lot of stuff. And actually, it, truth be told, and you know, we've actually had uh, two, three, three different bikes stolen and recovered because of the camera systems. And to the point of, of um, not put just throwing kids under the bus and, and, you know, immediately calling the police, but we've had some absolutely amazing conversations between the parents of the students whose bike was stolen and, and, and in, in all cases, well, actually two of the three, it was a middle school student that did the stealing, uh, actually a high school, middle school, and one of our own. And But the, the conversations when parents get involved with the lens of, we got to do what we can do to help this student now before they make bad decisions down the, you know, as they move older, forward and get older has been so impressive to me this year. And, and I have applauded our parents that have kept very cool, calm, collected, but made those conversations extremely meaningful. And it has made a difference. I, I got a call actually from the dad who doesn't speak English very well of a student that was involved and how meaningful, and he was thankful we had handled it the way we did. That doesn't happen all the time. I know it doesn't, but to the point of let's get at these kids and make a point early to try to change how they think about things, it's absolutely critical. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 we've utilized those, you know, strategies even at the elementary level and it's, um, it's impactful. It really is. And because of the technology, we're able to handle situations with very fact-based information. You can't argue with a camera. <laughs> so um, it helps. It helps a lot. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Yes. There's uh, also a question in the chats here, um, sort of shifting gears, but touching on a little bit, um, Chad had mentioned that in this one particular case with the bikes, I mean, it was elementary, middle, and high school that were involved in that. Um, in the high schools, I mean, there does uh, there's often some some gangs, particularly in Annadale High School, uh, but there's oftentimes the recruiting may start at the middle school level. So, what kind of um, you know, are you actually seeing this recruiting maybe taking place at homes, and are there prevention strategies in the school that the school is taking, both at homes and how can we prevent it maybe even starting even earlier? Well, I know that. Um... We have a gang unit task force um, that, that that specializes in kind of keeping an eye on all of the, the various trends in terms of recruitment, um, and 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 a lot of it, you know, some of that is is the road dog camp, which I talk about, which we get students involved because there is gang discussions and everything. Um, it does start at the SRO level, you know, where I talk to them, and um, while I don't give them the the full stories but I tell them my personal experiences of where that road will end if they continue in that that type of lifestyle um, there are things that I do see from time to time um, you know I think Holmes is a very good school uh, you know I, I do keep it I do keep an eye on it and if I do see it I do have those discussions if possible and like I said, like, I don't want to get in the weeds with the descriptions of what I've seen and what I've experienced, but I try and convey that from a personal level that like, that it is a very unsuccessful route if you were to go down that way. 
it, it never goes well. I have never met a billionaire gang member who's 60 years old and has been putting money into his 401k is now living the high life. So, you know, um, so I make it a point to kind of intervene when I do see him or anything that is concerning. So. Right. Any other questions here for Officer Harvey? None? All right. Well, um, we thank you very much for your time, Officer Harvey. I know you've had a long day and school year is almost done. So actually, that's, one, that's another question. What do, you, what do you do in the summertime when there is no uh, school in the session as an SRO? So under normal ideal conditions, um, we would be permitted the opportunity to do special assignments so we can go to gang, uh, gang task force. We can do uh, temporary assignments that we call it MCB, which would be the detectives who handle more high profile cases. Um, we've had one RSRO that was on the Marine patrol all summer. So he went around on a boat and got a tan. Um, I mean, he did other stuff too, honestly, but I'm just making fun of him because I know him personally. Um, I, but, you know, in regard to the, this particular summer, you know, I mean, across the, the globe, we're all having staff staffing issues, whether at the school level or even on the policing side. So we are going to be uh, patrolling. So when you see me out there, I'll be I'll be working primarily in the Mason patrol district, but I'll be working day work, pushing a cruiser, answering calls. So and then I'll be back into school August 15th. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. We've greatly appreciated it. And just like I had mentioned to Dr. LaCroix, I mean, you're always welcome back at our meetings. So thank you so much. Right. And uh, if there's anything else you wanted us to pass on to the membership, we're happy to do so as well. Yeah, I just, I appreciate the time. I wish you all nothing but the best. Um, and if, if you need anything from me, I'm in Holmes Middle School, just give me a call. They know where I'm at. So awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thank you. All right. So we are coming down towards the very, very end here of our, our time on the meeting. So the next item that we have on the agenda is the officer elections. So do we have anyone here from our nominating committee? Hey, Ken, this is Essen. Hi, Essen. How are you? Can, good. How are you guys doing this evening? Great. Great. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, we didn't have any more applicants, so not much changed since last meeting, but um, I can go over the applicants really quickly again. So for Vice President of Enrichment, uh, we had Karen um, Chumluski. <laughs> I hope I pronounced that okay. Um, for okay. Vice President Fundraising, Bobby Grady, Treasurer Tiffany um, Hahn. Secretary Caitlin Amron, for President-elect uh, Lauren Thorne, Vice President of Membership Daniel Delboy. Thank you for whoever's sharing the screen. Um, like I said, didn't have much change. If there um, is any, are any of the applicants that want to take some time to uh, maybe share some about them? I know most of the members are current board members as well. So, or most of the applicants, sorry. If not, um, I guess I'll hand it over to you, Ken. Okay, perfect. I was actually talking, but uh, <laughs> had my microphone <laughs> on mute. So, well, th yeah, thank you for that. So we're gonna go ahead and um, do the voting in this particular order. Before we um, call for additional floor nominations, just one thing to um, be aware of is the president-elect position. So president-elect is a position where you're automatically succeeding to president the following year. So it is a two-year commitment. Um, I was president-elect last year, became president at the conclusion of last year's term and, and president this year. My year is coming to an end. So um, Jen Delboy will be automatically becoming president. If um, whoever becomes the president-elect this year will then succeed to become president the following year. Uh, because of a change at Virginia PTA and their bylaws, they are actually phasing out the president-elect position. So this will be the last election to have a president-elect in that position. 
So just uh, kind of explaining that little part there. Uh, but with, as the nominating committee had presented, we do have Tiffany Hahn, who is our candidate for treasurer. Are there any other candidates for treasurer that wish to run from the floor? Okay, um, that's going once. Are there any other candidates who wish to run for treasurer running from the floor? Bylaws do say that we have to do it three times. So last chance, anybody who would like to run for treasurer from the floor? Okay, hearing none. Um, Tiffany, are there any words that you wish to say um, to the membership before we vote by acclamation? Uh, you're on mute. Just basically, I, I was part of the board this year, but I didn't really get to work with a lot of like be in the school because my my son is not in school yet so I'm looking forward to being in school and get you know get to know all the teachers like put a put a name um to the pace so I'm excited all right so since Tiffany is running unopposed is there a motion to uh approve by acclamation I motion okay so without objection um well, excellent. Just to be on the safe side, let's uh, say, is there a second to approve by acclamation? Second it. All right. So it was moved and seconded. And so we are now approving by acclamation since there are no objections. All right. So for secretary, we have Caitlin Amran, I hope I'm saying that right. I always call you Caitlin Lynch. You um, are. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, are there any nominations from the floor for anybody who wishes to run for secretary? Okay. Are there any nominations? Second call. Okay. And oopsie. Sorry about that. All right, last call, any nominations? Okay, so hearing none, the nominations are closed. And is there a motion of um, to approve by acclamation? Motion to approve. Okay, this is Tiffany, is there a second? Second. Okay, not sure who that was, but... Um, Note taker. So, all right. So no, uh, if there are no objections, then the motion to approve by acclamation is approved. So, all right. VP of fundraising, uh, Bobby Grady is the nominee, uh, the candidate here. Are there any, uh, anyone who's interested in running for VP of fundraising from the floor? I'm going once. Anyone interested in running from the floor VP of fundraising? Going twice. Last time, any nominations? Any uh, one wishing to run for VP of fundraising from the floor? All right. Hearing none, nominations are closed. And is there a motion of uh, to approve Bobby by acclamation? Lauren. Motion. All right, Lauren, and it sounds like Karen was a second there. All mm -hmm. right. So without any objections. It is, uh, you know, the, we are approving her by acclamation. All right. Uh, finally, we've got Karen here. So is there, uh, she is our, our nominee here. Is there anyone who wishes to run for VP of enrichment from the floor? All right. Hearing none, that's once. All right. Anybody who wishes to run for a nomination or anybody who wishes to run from the floor, VP of enrichment. All right, last call. Anyone who wants to run for VP of Enrichment from the floor? All right, hearing none, those nominations are closed. Is there a motion to approve Karen by as VP of Enrichment by acclamation? I'll make the motion oh. for Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Christiane. Is there a second? Is that, uh, I don't hear who the second was. Okay. This is Jen, I second. All right, thanks, Jen. All right, so. Uh, motion has been moved and seconded, and there are no objections. Karen is now um, VP of Enrichment again. All right, and are there, Dan Delboy is our VP for membership candidate. Are there any 
floor candidates who wish to run for VP of membership. All right. Any candidates from the floor who wish to run for VP of membership? And last call. Any candidates who wish to run for VP of membership? All right. Hearing none, those nominations are closed. Is there a motion to approve Dan Delboy by acclamation as VP of membership? Motion. All right. Sounded like Karen. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All right. It sounded like Tiffany. All right. So it's moved and seconded. And there, let's see, are there any, is so there no objections? Then we shall vote uh, Dan in by acclamation. All right. Lauren is, Thorn is our president elect candidate. Um, so while Lauren is considering running away, are there any candidates who wish to run from the floor as president elect? All right. Are there any <laughs> Anybody who uh, wants to run from the floor as president elect? All right. Last call. Anybody who wants to run from the floor? as president elect the last president is elect all right hearing none is there a motion to um to approve lauren by acclamation a motion all right that's karen is there a second a second all right it's tiffany and without hearing any objections it is by acclamation. So you're stuck in this position now, Lauren. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of you um, who have just been voted in by the, the board. Um, so it's, it's definitely great. Uh, so the just for transparency purposes, all of these positions that I'm highlighting, Secretary VP, all the VPs and the President-elect, they will assume office on July 1st. Um, Tiffany will be assuming office uh, at the conclusion of the audit, uh, which is uh, a typical thing that we do. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, but I believe that's correct. She takes office as soon as the audit is complete and been approved by, um, who's the audit approved by? Or the financial review? Hey, Amy? I think she's having computer issues. I think she was saying that that's correct, but. Um... Okay, so if, the, if there's um, an error to that, then I think we can just put that in the, in the chats then, but I believe that that is the case. So, all right, we have our board for next year. <laughs> Okay. All right, so just put something in the uh, chats, Amy, if there's anything incorrect on that. Uh, but the last thing I want to do before I turn the floor uh, over to Jen, I just want to go over really quickly just some of our accomplishments from this year and just really look at the... Um, look at kind of our, our strategic plan and just recap that. So our, our goal really was building resilient individuals through engaging collaboration. That was our theme that we had. Um, it was a response to a survey that was um, administered uh, to the membership in January of 2021. And our goal really was to be responsive, transparent, and focused on the theme throughout the year, uh, focus on different programs for enrichment, as well as fundraising with the emphasis on the fun part. And then finally, it was to continue supporting all of our teachers. Um, so our theme, Building Resilient Individuals Through Engaging Collaboration, had its roots really in the portrait of the graduate for two different um, aspects of it. And I'm not going to sit there and read through it. It is in our, annual, in our um, strategic plan, which is available on our website, nsespta.org. Uh, but again, it's rooted in the portrait of the graduate, as well as two core values from the National PTA. Um, we had a goal for membership. Um, our goal, the nationwide membership has dropped 3.4 million in the last 20 years. Um, these are what our membership numbers look like um, 
you know, the last couple of years, we had 115 members pre-pandemic from 97 families. It did significantly drop down during the pandemic. Uh, we set a goal this year to have 157 members. And um, we actually finished the year with 126 members from 64 families. So we had more members than we did uh, pre-pandemic, but we had fewer families that joined. So our goal of having two um, memberships really, uh, really did kind of pan out. Um, as far as student enrichment goes, we had our spelling bee, we had Mathathon, and we also had Eco Club and Chess Club, um, which we supported. Uh, teacher support, we also had um, teacher grants. We had uh, club grants that we provided uh, for the teachers. We had different teacher appreciation events throughout the year, both uh, before the holidays as well as uh, during teacher appreciation week. Uh, we had a lot of stuff that we focused on on programming uh, from Beaver Blast Off in the spring fair to start and end the year. Uh, we had movie night, as we talked about earlier today. And we also, of course, had Mathathon. You'll see Mathathon pop up quite a bit. Um, budgeting and fundraising, you know, as we talked about at the beginning of the year, we really didn't know what our budget was going to uh, really be able to, to pull off, but, you know, we still accomplished quite a bit, so, you know, from Krispy Kreme fundraisers to flocking and uh, restaurant nights, and of course, Mathathon. Um, our focus on connectivity and transparency, which is kind of the root of the um, different, uh, the, the survey that was administered. Uh, we had coffee talks. We had a weekly brew, uh, and we also had a Thursday folders. We were able to print some of our PTA events in there. And one thing that's not on there um, is the School of Excellence program. That was also rooted in connectivity. Um, but we had a virtual suggestion box. Um, I did say in the strategic, we did say in the strategic plan that I would have like, uh, some Q and A's that I'd offer periodically. That is one thing that we did not do um, that I should have done, and I apologize for that. Uh, compliance, we talked about in the strategic plan doing bylaws and having to update the bylaws, but that was um, until the Virginia PTA did uniform bylaws, which required us not to have to update our bylaws, which is was something that was every five years. Um, we had some standard record keeping um, that we, we tried to do by having um, the PTA, the standard PTA officer email addresses consistently used, so it makes it easier from one board to the next to be able to um, you know, really uh, continue to, to have some back history on some of our conversations and communications. Uh, we had, uh, so as far as evaluating how we executed the strategic plan and implemented it, um, for my self-evaluation, to be honest, I mean, I would say that I was probably a, a B plus president this year. Um, I think if you were to look at like when I was civic association president, I would, I'd probably say, I, unselfishly, I probably was an A plus president for Civic Association. Um, honestly, I'd give myself a B plus for, um, for, for the work that we did this year. But as a whole, I would say that the PTA uh, and the officers had an A plus effort. And that is simply because of the fact we had such amazing people that were uh, co-running the PTA with me. So uh, while my performance was not as uh, where I would have liked it to be, I think that the PTA as a whole and the officers as a whole really elevated it. And I, I really thank all of you, um, Jen and Jen in particular, but Jen and Dan and Lauren and Karen and Tiffany and um, Amy. And I hope I didn't miss anybody. I think I got everyone. Um, but definitely thank you so much for that. Thank you for the wonderful volunteers that helped to make this, um, you know, a, a great effort as well. And so for next year's board, I, uh, I would say that when I was Civic Association president and turning over the reins to another president, I, I did have some reservations on how things were going to go. I would say with Jen taking over the presidency next year, um, I have absolutely zero reservations in her ability to lead, and I think she's going to really take the PTA in a very fantastic direction as we have a full year of normalcy, knock on wood, free year, for a full year of normalcy, which was something we were not really afforded this year. So again, I have no reservations for Jen and for all the other incoming officers, and I know you all will do an outstanding job. And um, Chad, I hope that you're going to be able to keep up with their activity level. So they're, they're going to be hitting the ground hard, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So I want to thank everybody from the membership here um, about uh, our engaging collaboration. And if there are any questions that you have, 
Um, I think in the interest of time, just feel free to email me. I can put my email in the chats, but I do want to turn the floor over just really quickly uh, unannounced here to, to Jen Delvoy. Um, actually, it looks like John, Jen may have signed off, but I was going to give Jen an opportunity to talk about next year. So um, I'm sure she's got a lot that she, she could say and would want to say. But with that said, I guess I can uh, answer any questions that you might have before we have a motion to adjourn for the evening. All right. No questions? Okay. Well, is there a motion of unanimous consent to adjourn for the evening? I motion. All right. Uh, thank you, Karen. And without any objection, it's so ordered and we are adjourned for the evening. Thank you so very much for your support this year. And thank you. Uh, I want to thank my, my wife, especially, and all the other PTA members and officers who made it such a fantastic year. So have a great evening, have a great summer, and I look forward to seeing you on the other side of uh, the, uh, the PTA. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.